Chapter 2 Father of the Daleks 1. It did not begin with the Doctor, of course, but he was there at the beginning, and for that, Davros would never forgive him. 2. Exterminate! The cry blared from a thousand vocoders, a toneless thunder rolling from horizon to horizon. The Daleks spun down upon the world of Griffin's Reach, fat cylinder after fat cylinder, glowing with friction, as they took their place in formation, bullets deciding where to strike. As one, they dived, billowing dust from the Reach's endless grimy plains. From the command ship in orbit, Davros's scanners outlined a thousand red dots which scattered and vanished as what little wildlife there was went to ground, or simply died of shock at the majesty of his children making planet fall. Exloding coordinates of the facility, Davros croaked, feeling that familiar thrill as the Daleks responded like the memory of his long lost limbs. Just for a moment, the cold confines of his command ship fell away. The empty halls, the snarled throne of wires and input feeds. Just for a moment, it felt as though he was striding the desiccated surface of Griffin's reach. A father and his children. An empire. A family. Daleks, he growled. Exterminate. 3. Christmas on Lavellan. It amazes me sometimes, Davros said. It was evening. They had found a little cafe off one of the main squares. Most of the tables were deserted. The sky had turned a fantastic shade of violet, and the canopy of hard light above their heads was igniting each falling snowflake in a minute, dazzling flare like a fleet making planet fall, Davros thought, like the end of the world. What amazes you? A Lavellanese waiter, all feathers and tentacles, tried to hand Davros a menu, but he waved the waiter off. He never ate at these things. He rarely ate at all anymore. Not since his second reconstruction? His third? He wasn't sure. Somewhere along the line, digestion had seemed more trouble than it was worth. Christmas, Davros said. Christmas on Levallon. Why do they celebrate it? It's an Earth holiday, is it not? Well, the other man said, I imagine there's a story behind that. He tapped his chin. Or maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just what happens when you're willing to share a universe. Cross-pollination? There might be a human colony somewhere out there celebrating the first descendancy of Lavelle. Though you'd need a lot of feather bows, I suppose. Like a virus, Davros said, an idea pathogen, carried not in the cells or the blood, but in the hearts and minds of those infected. He took a stylus from a pocket, and absently began to scratch formulae on the tablecloth. The doctor frowned. They're going to make me pay for that, you know. 4. The Khaled of Scarrow the ancient bitter race to which Davros had once belonged, before he forged his own superior people, were unsurprisingly fond of romanticising conflict. Davros's childhood had featured a succession of wrinkled, half-mad tutors preaching the glory of Scarrow that was, as if that planet still existed and hadn't long ago been reduced to an irradiated no-man's land by a thousand-year war. Now they were all gone, bar him. He was the last Khaled, and the Daleks, who were no more the descendants of the Khaleds than a pearl was descended from the grit that formed it, had no time for the past. Not when the future was there to be won. Exterminate! A battle cry. A promise. A threat. An entire race and culture distilled into a single mechanical shriek spat in the face of the universe. Exterminate, Davros whispered to himself in the clammy egg of his command throne. Drool had frozen on his upper lip. Exterminate.
Laminate. Griffin's Reach was not the most illustrious beginning to a crusade, truth be told. Various races had conquered the dingy little planet over the eons, in the way that one might examine a grubby penny before deciding it wasn't worth the trouble. It was a forgotten place, a nothing place, remarkable only in how unremarkable it was, particularly to the Daleks, whose eyes, like the eyes of all predators, were drawn to movement and colour. There was little colour to Griffin's reach. Not unless you knew where to look. Facility located. Commencing attack. The facility didn't possess a title. Not that his children had asked. It was just a low dome built into the underside of a grey and crumbling cliff. Its surface ridged with sensor baffles and perception filters that did nothing at all to hide it from the Dalek's newly upgraded sensors. They should have come to me sooner. The Daleks had been combing this region of space for weeks, turning to him only when all of their options were exhausted. He could tell it cost them to do so. Admitting defeat was not in their design. But was that not always the way? They were his children. He was their failsafe. But no matter. They called. That was enough. That was always enough. Davros pulsed a command, and a comms channel opened between him and the facility. Gloating was a bad habit, according to Khaled philosophy. But that didn't matter. Davros had rewritten all those lessons a long time ago. Besides, he was lonely. Doctor, he purred into the comms. We have come for you. Five. Christmas on Traxamere Beta. The Lumineers Guild had outdone themselves this year. Each of the great crimson barges hanging over the capital had been strung with a hundred thousand lanterns, now hanging dark and deactivated against the swollen red globes like the pips of strawberries. Below the rooftop bar in which Davros sat, the streets were packed to groaning with excited onlookers, all here for the flicking of a switch. I don't understand, he muttered. Why are you doing this? The doctor stared into his drink. Tiny photoplasmic algae gleamed in its depths. Traxamir was a dark world with a weak sun. Light was many things here. Currency, communication, and during this, the darkest day of the year, it became a celebration. The doctor took an experimental sip, the light spiralling and sparking down his throat. It made his new face gleam from the inside out. Not a daiquiri, he said, but it'll do. And why you, Davros said, this young form, come to mock me? All your many reconstructions, the doctor said, looking out over the crowds with a rueful smile. And your skin is still always so thin. Always looking for insults, for challenges. Why can't I just be here to talk? He set his drink back down. And I have been talking. Not to you, but to... Me, I suppose. A few me's, actually. You know that we like talking. Davros grunted. The doctor looked around. There was something different about him. Davros could see it. Not his face. That changed all the time. But these meetings had rules. And one of those rules was that they always came alone. No allies, no minions, no traps, no threats. And without an assistant to show off for... This doctor was different, quieter, less prone to dramatics. It didn't snow on Traxamir Beta, but there was a thrilling snap of cold to the air. That's what Christmas can be sometimes, the doctor said. A time for talking. But why you? Davros repeated. Because I've never met you and you've never met me, the doctor said, running a hand through his shock of brown hair. Davros looked at him, the long coat, the bow tie, the childlike smile, and the old, tired eyes. Why do I always rebuild myself exactly as before? Every time he died, every time. That limits me, the doctor continued. 
It limits what I can say about where you're going and where I've been. But we decided it was worth it, that you might be more inclined to listen to someone you had less of a history with. I have a history with all of you, Davros said quietly. You think I care what face you wear? The cold air was sour in his mouth. The oxygen separators in his chest were degrading, as they did every century or so. He would have to replace them. There was always so much work to be done. Do you know what I see, Doctor, when I look at you? At any of you? The doctor shook his head. I see the look in your eyes the first time we met, all the way back on Scarrow, when my children were in their infancy, and you arrived to take it all away before it could even start. Something dark passed across the doctor's face. I didn't have a choice. The Time Lords... Davros waved his hand. It was aching, a spreading chill where metal and flesh met. Why do I never build myself young? We met, and just for a moment, you threatened everything I had created. You held the controls of my life support in your hand, and you demanded that I destroy them, or you would destroy me. To know, the doctor quoted, that life and death on such a scale was my choice. To know that the tiny pressure of my thumb would end everything. Davros smirked to hear his own words in the doctor's mouth. Your casing doesn't matter to me, Doctor. I never forget who I'm looking at. So why accept my offer to come? The doctor asked. Why agree to meet me this Christmas? Or at Christmas on Lavellon? Or anywhere? Davros fell silent, staring up at the barges crowding the sky. Curiosity, the doctor said eventually. That's why I chose Traxamir Beta. The lights we're about to see are famous in this bit of the galaxy, and I've never seen them before. That's why I chose this Christmas, out of all the millions that are out there. The lights came on. They were so bright, Davros had to turn away. You've never seen them before either, I imagine, the doctor said. Davros bristled at his certainty. How do you know? Well, the place is still standing for a start, the doctor said his youthful grin painted red and green and gold by the celebrations above. After a moment, Davros smiled back. 6. It didn't take long. It never did in Davros's experience. He could spend years planning, years plotting and hypothesising and dissecting, ever dissecting the failures, both his children's and his own. But in the end, victory and defeat always arrived in a single, narrow moment, like a dagger in the dark. The facility on Griffin's Reach had once been Krillotane, and it was in the business of invisibility. The winged reptilian race were the opposite of the Daleks in many ways. Davros had built his children to be superior, to be unique, to reject other life with religious zeal. The Krillotane, by comparison, were scavengers, parasites, thieves of DNA. They infiltrated other races, taking their forms and eating whole civilizations from within. Word had reached the Dalek Empire that the Krillotane were a hair's breadth away from developing some sort of phase cloak, true, complete invisibility. A tactical advantage no other race must be allowed to possess. That was the purpose of this invisible facility on an unremarkable world. That was the prize, and Davros had been summoned to make sure the Doctor could not take it from them. Aquire! Aquire! The Daleks poured down the corridors of the facility like wasps attacking a hive. The Krillotane fought back in their scattered mongrel way. Ambushes, scavenged weaponry, even herding genetically engineered warrior forms into the invaders' paths. Davros's systems recorded every second of the conflict, every shot and scream and kill, but the scientist himself paid only half a mind. Davros knew the strengths of his soldiers, the power of his children. He held no concern for them. And yet, 
Doctor? He hissed, fingers flying over the controls, so that his voice seeped from every single intercom at once. Allying with the Krillitane? I thought you had some standards. Nothing. No response. Davros took a deep, shuddering breath, wincing as the compressor vents in his chest chugged and seized. He had been in the middle of a repair cycle when his children had called. They might have waited. He might have asked them to wait. No. The business of Empire called. And when it called, Davros answered. Doctor, he wheedled. I might show mercy. An hour since planetfall. Civilizations had fallen in less, especially when the Doctor was involved. No one knew better than Davros that the Doctor loved to talk, and yet, in that hour, he had not said a single word. Davros had engineered worry out of his children. To worry was to admit, however privately, that failure was an option. Not for the first time, he wished he had also done so for himself. For silence from the doctor was worrying. Silence meant the doctor had better things to do than talk. Exterminate! Davros thumbed the controls. Keep focus, my children! Two Daleks fell to a proton blaster. Another exploded as a Krillitane warrior tore apart its casing. The reserve forces Davros had ordered to stay in the upper atmosphere were now spiralling downwards, their life signs spiking on Davros's screens as they scented blood. Rage. Always they raged, getting bogged down in slaughter, lashing out at the indignity of being opposed. The doctor is the foe here, Davros cautioned. This technology is the prize. Everything else is a distraction. Exterminate! They weren't listening. Too busy snarling and snapping at each other, baying like hounds on the hunt. They are what you made them, Davros told himself, for what might have been the thousandth time. You cannot resent the pure for being pure. And that was the truth of it. The heart of it. The other races of the galaxy scorned the Daleks for their maddened hatred of all other life, unaware that it was all their fault. The Daleks thought only of extermination because there were foes still to exterminate. Had the rest of life in the universe had the good grace to lie down and die, his children would be far more serene. Davros. And there he was. The co-author of Dalek Rage. The midwife to their annihilating hate. Davros, you need to stop. That voice. It was always the same, no matter how different. Davros's boards lit up as weapons charged to dangerous capacity, as units pulled back from engagements or spun their casing crowns in berserk delight. Now the Daleks listened. Now they focused. Davros's chest compressors wheezed in and out. I'm giving you one chance, Davros. Call off your monsters. Retreat to high orbit. I don't want to... Davros! Creator! Yes, Davros breathed. There was no capacity for emotional range in the voice of a Dalek. Davros knew that. He had designed them himself. But every time it came to this moment, this narrow moment between the Doctor, the Daleks and him, he imagined it trembled just a bit. Do not waver, my children. Trust the augmented sensors I bestowed upon you. No matter what they have built here, he cannot hide from us. The uncertainty smoothed itself away. That was the job of a father. The prize will be found. The doctor has been anticipated. Hiding will not be permitted. The Daleks swarmed in, weathering the fire from the Krillitane defenders or ignoring it completely. 
Always running, always hiding, Davros murmured into the comms. When will you learn, Doctor? Some problems can only be faced head on. I'm beginning to agree with you, the Doctor responded. And then the world went black. 7. Christmas, on the red moon of Zhe. You're wasting your time, Davros said. I'm not going to see the light or recognise some sort of virtue or value to all these civilizations you show me. You're wasting your time. Time is the one thing I have lots of, the doctor said, pressing a pair of monoculars to his lean face. What am I to do but waste it? Ahead, the first of the tribe's people tethered the great armour-plated beasts that were their mounts and homes. Vast, shaggy heads protruded from under spiked bone crests, staring blearily down at their keepers. Each one was the size of a city block, a mountain of flesh and shell that could house more than fifty people on its back. In the light of the red sky, they were the colour of dried blood. Then I must consider my time, if you will not. The ground was uneven, cracked and baked by the unforgiving sun, and the anti-grabs of Davros's chair whirred as they sought to make sense of it. The plains of Zhe seemed to go on forever, red and desolate as a Dalek eye lens. Curiosity may sustain you, Doctor, but I have work to do. Wait. Davros half turned, and then shook his head. The tribespeople were making camp. They hadn't seemed to notice the two men on the hill. One young and striking, the other folded over himself in a cramped bundle of limbs, his lower half encased in stainless steel. The thin atmosphere pulled and dragged at Davros's lungs. When the first tribesman began to sing, his voice tremoring high and clear through the oxygen-starved air, Davros was unmoved. No, he said simply, I won't wait. What am I supposed to be learning, Doctor? What puzzle am I supposed to solve? I have never understood this foolish obsession you have with Christmas, and I do not understand why it has brought us two-thirds of the way across the known universe to this unforgiving nothing rock. Because it's just a word, the Doctor lowered his monoculars. It was the same face as before, but different, older seeming. Davros found himself wondering what those eyes saw from one Christmas to the next. I forget sometimes how incredible language is. The TARDIS translates, you see. Makes things simple. The doctor breathed out a long plume of cold air. But there are words, simple words, that you can say to a million different people in a hundred different eras. And to each person, the word will have a meaning that is personal and unique. A tribeswoman had joined in, face lifted to the freezing sky. Another had turned a fragment of a shell into a drum and was slapping out a rhythm with hard and breathless joy. Christmas is just a word. Here it means singing. In other places it means lights. It can mean religion or family or celebrating reaching winter's halfway point. It's a... selection box. I don't know what that means, Davros said. There was something about the song the tribe's people were singing, or the lack of oxygen in the air. He didn't feel like himself. It would take a surprising amount of time to explain, the doctor said, but you can choose the meaning of Christmas. You can build your own traditions, build it like an engine, so that it's entirely personal to you. You choose what it means. You choose the effect it has on the universe. There aren't many words like that. Words like Christmas. His gaze fell on Davros. Words like, father. Something in the intensity of the doctor's gaze made Davros recoil. Something he had seen once, long ago. I am a scientist, Davros snapped, angry at himself for flinching. I do not engage in ridiculous wordplay. Don't you, the doctor said. You're still a car led, Davros. No matter how many bits you lop off or replace. All those lessons... All that philosophy? For a thousand years, words were the only thing your kind had to pass on to each other. So? Davros hissed. He didn't like this. 
He understood the mechanics of war. He could design weapons of destruction that would have terrified the generals who trained him. But as always, when he faced the Doctor, the Time Lord felt just a half-step ahead. Christmas can mean anything, Davros. So can Father. But Dalek? The Doctor shook his head. Dalek just means Dalek. A force of hatred, a force of destruction, of annihilation. And you are the only person who could make it mean something else. The gentleness had disappeared from the Doctor's voice. Instead there was now hunger, the fierceness that shone through when wit met will and empires turned on the edge of a knife. He hid it well, mostly, especially when there was a human to impress. But Davros knew that ambition, that anger. It made the Doctor bearable. I can stop the Daleks, Davros. I can beat them, time and time again, but you could change them. He knelt beside Davros, eyes bright and pleading wide, and Davros fought the urge to pull away, to hide the vulnerable controls of his systems with his hand. I've considered it, he whispered. The thought has occurred. His compressors wheezed in and out. The atmosphere, yes, it was the thinness of the atmosphere, nothing more. You are right in what you say. I have created them to mean one thing and one thing only. They are not adaptable. They do not change or learn or grow. They are what they will be. His voice quivered before he could straighten it out. But if I did change them, they would not be Daleks. They would not be my children. But they don't love you, Davros. The doctor's voice was gentle again. They never will. If they loved me, Davros said, they would not be my children. He looked out over the plain, where a hundred tribespeople sang their hearts out for no audience but the desert, Christmas, and two old men. It is beautiful, Doctor. Thank you for showing me. 8. We summoned you to counteract the Doctor. This was not achieved. Griffin's reach shrank as Davros's command ship pulled away. There were still Daleks on the planet, firing again and again into whatever they could find. But Davros's work was done. Synaptic phase cloaking, he muttered. A mixture of Gallifreyan and Krillitane biotech materialising inside the senses of the observer themselves, sliding like a curtain between mind and nerve. I should have known. I should have... We were unable to access our systems. We were trapped in the dark of ourselves. It was not optimal. It had been torture. Cloaking technology was just that. A cloak. A barrier between the seer and the seen. That was why the technology was so rare. It was almost impossible to hide something so completely that no part of it could be detected. The doctor had not tried to hide the Krillitane. He had interfered with Davros and his Daleks' own systems, severing the links between their biological senses and their casings, hiding them from themselves. It had only lasted minutes by Davros's internal clock. But for that moment, that terrible, eternal moment, every single Dalek in the fleet had been plunged into darkness. Deprived of their senses, shorn from the might of their machine bodies, and reduced to the wet nothing of their flesh existence. Bacteria in a petri dish, trapped alone with their futile rage. Some had self-destructed. Most had gone mad, though even Davros could admit that it was becoming harder and harder to make the distinction between which of his children were sane and which were not. When the cloaking field had disengaged, the doctor had been gone. I understand what he did. Davros said. And it was true. He did, now that he had seen it. That was ever the issue. Playing catch-up again. Next time, we will not be taken by surprise. There will not be a next time. For just a moment, 
Davros was back in that darkness. His mechanical lungs wheezing and clattering, struggling to keep him alive. Watch! We will not be contacting you again! I don't understand, Davros said. I know what he did. I can redesign you to defend against it. I can... I can help! We do not require your help. We require victory. Goodbye, creator. The link went dead. Nine. Christmas, on Alacrisis 4. Davros had already found a table by the time the doctor arrived, weaving through the crowd in topcoat and tails. The bazaar was packed with last-minute shoppers, each stall glorious in festive finery of neon and crushed velvet. Merchants paced behind their stalls, demanding, cajoling, and incense burners coughed a thousand streams of smoke into the dark bowl of the sky, filling the air with a haze of cinnamon and soot. Davros watched the doctor make his way through the crush, stopping here and there to joke with a vendor or examine a piece of polished glass. He made it look very easy, as if he was genuinely interested in the price of glish fruit or the origin of a statue, despite being part of a civilization so advanced that by comparison the people of Alacrisis IV were insects grubbing in the dirt. What am I missing? Davros asked himself. Is there significance, and I simply do not see it? You're early, the doctor said as he sat down. The bazaar was full of little places offering mulled wine and pastries from a dozen different worlds. Davros handed the doctor a menu he hadn't opened himself. I've been thinking about your offer. The doctor lingered over his choice, before finally brushing his fingers across the menu's surface. An android waiter in the corner jerked as it received the order, then began ladling hot wine into a cup. I'm glad to hear it, the Time Lord said. Things have to change. I agree. It is... Davros paused. It is not easy to say this. It is harder to do it. But I have to admit that there is truth to what you say. You can continue to thwart my Daleks forever... But that will never change them. They will only hate more, harm more aggressively. They know only one solution to being stopped, and that is to lash out more violently than before. The waiter placed the doctor's drink before him, and the doctor wrapped his long fingers round it. That's why I contacted you, he said. I'm scared, Davros, of what might happen in the future, should we continue to clash. The wine smelled sweet delicate. Davros looked at the menu sitting in front of the doctor. He could ask for some. He still possessed smell and taste faculties. They were useful for laboratory work. He could have a drink with the doctor. His old enemy. His old friend. It was Christmas after all. I'm scared too, he said instead. Something has to change. The tone of his voice made the doctor meet his eyes, even as the first of the Daleks disengaged their cloaking field. Shoppers began to scream. Oh, Davros, the doctor said. Really? Exterminate! Ten. I see you got it working, the doctor said. They were surrounded. More than a hundred Daleks, some afloat, others hunched amid the flattened remains of stalls. The merchants and shoppers had all fled, and Davros could tell, even without his scanners and screens, that his children ate to turn and fire, to chase moving prey. As always, however, the doctor's presence had an incredibly focusing effect. It wasn't difficult, Davros said. He shook his head, enjoying the moment. Working with the Crillotane doctor? For shame. Rebels, the doctor said flatly. A splinter group who want no part of their people's expansion. I was helping them find a way to hide. A way to escape the brood mother's eternal wars. He took a long sip of his wine. Families disagree sometimes. Except 
mine, Davros spat. Is that it? Creator, Davros knew. He knew there could be no emotion bar hate in the voice of a Dalek. But he let himself imagine that his children were proud. You have delivered our greatest enemy to us? Yes, Davros said. Well, tis the season. Isn't that right, Doctor? And there it was, the change. Davros had seen it before, and it was as profound as a regeneration. The tiredness vanished. The lanky shoulders rose. The chin lifted, as if preparing to take a blow or a bow. The doctor had an audience now, and the compressors began to wheeze in Davros's chest. Do you know what's good? the doctor said. Do you know what's really very extremely good about this situation right now? You are surrounded! You are unarmed! Nothing is good! I'm always surrounded, the doctor said. I'm always unarmed. That's where I do my best work. He lunged to his feet, and the front row of Daleks flinched. You know that, don't you boys? That's why you haven't fired. You're afraid I've got some scheme or failsafe, and the second you fire on me is the second that trap springs, he grinned. Tell me I'm wrong. The silence stretched for too long before Davros broke it. This is foolishness, my children. He comes defenceless to these truces. Exactly right, the doctor interrupted. No allies, no backup. Not a biscuit. Isn't that strange? Isn't that unnerving? No, Davros snapped. It isn't. Stop, stop this. The doctor continued as if Davros hadn't spoken. But this is Christmas, and I'm going to be generous. Here's my counter-offer. Counter-offer! Davros practically shouted. My children are not stupid, Doctor. Stop this theatre! The creator will be silent! Davros froze. Who said that? Who said that to me? Not a single Dalek responded. Their focus on the Doctor was absolute. Families at Christmas, the Time Lord said. They're always the same. Tell you what, boys, I'll let you kill me. I won't resist. He turned towards Davros, and his smile had disappeared. Just kill him, too. Davros laughed, high and cracked and wheezing. You must be truly desperate, Doctor. He shook his head. My children, this has gone on long enough. Kill the Time Lord! It was difficult, even for Davros, to read expression on a Dalek, but as the neon signs fizzled and the wine bubbled and boiled over in its mulling pot, it seemed that the hundred Daleks surrounding them might be suddenly lost in thought. Children! Davros repeated. Kill him! With a low whine, fifty Daleks turned to point their weapons at Davros. No! he whispered. No, you can't. You wouldn't. To kill the doctor, to achieve victory, there is nothing we would not do. This is how you built them, Davros, the doctor said. This is how they were made. Do not do this, doctor. Do not do this. The doctor spread his hands, a charlatan professing empty palms and innocence, just before the climax of a trick. I'm not doing anything. This is on you. From the beginning, this was always on you. Doctor, please! The Daleks fired. Eleven. Later, just a little later, when the smoke had cleared, the doctor finished the last of his wine. Sirens were blaring in the distance. The authorities of Alacrasis IV, no doubt having detected the sudden absence of Dalek life signs, were rushing to show their control of the situation. Merchants were already returning, picking their way through the rubble. Shoppers, too, lifting bags dropped in the chaos. Christmas, re-establishing itself in little spreading islands of calm.
The cinnamon scent of smoke still leaked from the incense burners, mingling with the smog from the broken Dalek husks. You didn't have a failsafe, Davros said eventually. Of course I did, the doctor said. I had you. Tell me, do they know you build them to self-destruct if they ever turn on you? No. Does it happen often? I need to take precautions, Davros said numbly. My children are unpredictable. No, the doctor said. They're not. Merry Christmas, Davros. He placed his cup back down on the little table. I hope we do not meet again. 12. It was the day after Christmas. Davros had instructed his servant creatures to bring the Dalek corpses on board. It wouldn't do to have the wider empire learn about his precautions, and the workshops deep within his command ship always needed new resources. He had Dalek models dating back to his very first experiments on Skaro, and there was usually much calm to be found in delving into his designs, assessing, improving, perfecting. It felt like conversation. Now, though, silence seemed preferable broken only by the whirring of Davros's chair as he drifted through the cluttered metal halls. It was time travel, in a way. Not the graceful sailing of the Time Lords, but a creaky, halting passage through the monuments of a failed life. There, the dissected remains of a supreme Dalek. Here, the arachnid chassis he had never quite been able to make work. Sensor globes and shoulder slats, Dome lights and eye stalk after eye stalk after eye stalk, all looking at him with blank, rote hatred. Distantly, he noticed that his engineered servants were following him, cowering and clicking at each other, unused to silence after a defeat. Rage was more common, spitting curses, making promises that next time the doctor would not thwart him. Next time. Next time time. To achieve victory, there is nothing we would not do. Nothing, except listen to their father. Nothing, except trust him to know what was best. Is this all I am? He whispered. Is this all I am for? Davros, the last Khaled. Davros, the scientist who had once dreamed of holding the universe in his hand. Davros, the father chasing the love of the creatures, he had himself designed never to feel it. We do not require your help. Fine, he said. Fine! A strange feeling was blooming in his chest. Live without me, fight without me, die without me, ungrateful children, undeserving, I contain more than you. A fierce grin cracked his features. I always have. The words made him feel young again. Creator, the voice thundered through the command ship. We require you. War has been declared. War on Gallifrey itself. A time war. A final war. Will you aid us? For a moment, there was nothing but the sound of Davros's chest compressors wheezing in and out. Yes! His voice cracked with a father's pride. Yes! Don't forget to click below and subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel.